KQED newsroom. Our special guest, Dr. Monica Gandhi, shares her insight about a potential COVID-19 winter surge. And our political experts tell us about California lawmakers taking on big oil and gas in Washington, D.C., and how they're addressing problems with the state's employment agency in Sacramento. Plus, Halloween and Dia de los Muertos are around the corner. We take in some autumn festivities in this week's edition of Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, October 29th, 2021. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Priya David Clemens and this is KQED Newsroom. Let's catch up on state news with the Friday Five, our picks for some of the top stories in California this week. Reservoirs across Northern California have slightly higher water levels thanks to last weekend's drenching storm. The combination weather events of a bomb cyclone and an atmospheric river broke 100 year rain records in parts of Northern California, including here in San Francisco, where we had our wettest ever day in October. But state water officials do say that in order to escape our severe drought, we need a lot more rain. Governor Gavin Newsom received his COVID-19 vaccine booster shot this week and encouraged all eligible Californians to get our boosters too. Also, the Food and Drug Administration has just authorized emergency use of the COVID-19 vaccine for children age 5 to 11. And California health officials are ready to roll out vaccinations on school campuses as soon as next week. On Thursday, Facebook announced their corporate name is now Meta, while the app will retain the name Facebook. Despite recent revelations about the company's role in online extremism and misinformation, Facebook's profits grew 17% in the third quarter compared to the same time period last year. This week, executives from California-based tech companies, TikTok, Snapchat, and YouTube, were questioned in Congress about their methods for protecting children and teens from online bullying and adult content. What are you doing to stop bullying on Snapchat? Senator, this is a um, incredibly um, moving issue for me as a parent as well. Bullying is unfortunately something we're seeing more and more happening to our kids. And indeed, this is not just on the online community. They face it at school. They bring it at home. We have zero tolerance on Snapchat for bullying or harassment of any kind. And as a platform that reaches so many young people, we see this as a responsibility to get in, in front of this issue and do everything we can to stop it. $9 billion is the new price tag for the BART extension to San Jose, according to the Federal Transit Administration, which is going to provide $2.3 billion towards the project. That new $9 billion figure is twice as much as the original cost estimate. And top members of the Newsom administration will travel to Scotland for the United Nations Climate Conference next week. The UN released a report this week warning that the world's leaders still aren't doing enough to prevent, quote, catastrophic climate change. The governor's office says the goal is to highlight California's groundbreaking policies to combat the intensifying climate crisis and rally the global community to end their reliance on oil. In California's number one export is electric vehicle. 60 headquarter companies in the state, 34 manufacturing companies. Over half the electric vehicles in this country, or roughly half, are purchased in this state and owned in this state. And that's this week's Friday Five. I'll be joined later by our political experts, but first. In California, roughly one out of eight people have tested positive for the coronavirus, some more than once, for a total of 4,600,000 cases. More than 71,000 Californians have died from illnesses linked to the virus. In recent months, the virus appears to be abating as hospitalizations and case rates have dropped to persistently low numbers throughout most of the state. However, those numbers are now trending slightly higher, and public health officials are sounding the alarm that we could be up for a coronavirus surge this winter unless we take action to prevent it. Joining us now by Skype is Dr. Monica Gandhi, an infectious disease expert at UCSF. Dr. Gandhi, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So are you concerned about a winter surge in COVID cases? I think we can never say never about anything anymore with the coronavirus. Um, the one thing that I think we have to take into account is that there are 80% of those of us over 12 vaccinated in the state of California. And 
Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Sweden opened up completely at a rate of 80%, full vaccination over 12. And they have been seeing increased cases as they've opened up. They've even stopped mass mandates, but at least over five weeks, because Denmark opened on September 10th, so now it's been more than six weeks, have not seen an increase in deaths or hospitalizations. This is often what a what a vaccine or immunity does. It prevents you from getting severe disease. So we could see more cases, hopefully not hospitalizations. So what do you think about this weekend with Halloween coming up and Dio de las Muertes coming up right after that? You know, Dr. Fauci has said Americans can go out and enjoy Halloween as usual, especially if you're vaccinated. But what's your advice, particularly as this is a holiday where young children who aren't vaccinated are generally mingling with lots of other people and putting their hands in bowls of candy? You know, we have not seen surges since we started vaccinating over holiday weekends. We didn't see it over Labor Day, um, and this is um, the next holiday. Uh, you know, we should have probably done Halloween last year because it's outside. We have mm -hmm. to remember that literally September 2020, the University of Canterbury performed a scoping review of how low outside transmission is and said, tell everyone to go outside until we can get vaccines. So this is an outside activity. Children have been restricted enough. They should absolutely be trick-or-treating. And then inside activities in dense circumstances, I think we have, again, the high enough vaccination rates. But certainly you can keep your child masked inside. Um, until they can get vaccinated. All right, well, let's talk about kids getting vaccinated because it looks like that could be happening very soon. California is preparing to vaccinate many. And I want to talk here a little bit about what Dr. Ghali, the Secretary of Health and Human Services for California, just said about vaccinating that 5 to 11-year-old age range. This is about prioritizing kids. This is about protecting young people, I think is key. 9% of the state's population is 5 to 11. Do you know what that means? That means adding 9 potentially 9% more to that blanket of protection that has helped lead the nation in terms of vaccine rates. Do you have any advice for parents as they prepare to vaccinate their young children in the coming weeks? Um, you know, I'm going to be vaccinating my 11 year old as soon as I can. I will say three things why we'd want to vaccinate children. One is that, yes, the risk of severe disease is much lower in children. It would be unwise to not say that uh, epidemiologically. However, during the Delta surge in areas of low vaccination across the country, there were increased cases in children and importantly, increased hospitalizations in children, again, in areas of low vaccination because we weren't protecting our children. and any severe outcome that you can prevent, even if it is a low cause of death in children. If I had a vaccine to prevent um, a child from ever having a car accident and it's safe, I would say, let's give that vaccine. So that's the number one reason. Number two, reduce transmission to others. Absolutely, this is a fair reason to give a vaccine. We live in communities with older grandparents and adults, and Dr. Gailey is right about that. It protects others. And then third is we've had the most restrictions in our state of any to children. I think that's no, no, that's not a surprise to anyone. 50 out of 50 in school openings last year. It is imperative for children to get back to normal life. Um, and I mean normal life, like not masking and not living in schools, like um, with a lot of fear and quarantines. It's imperative to go back to normal life. There's a mental health emergency declared by the American Academy of Pediatrics on October 19th from all our restrictions on children to protect others. So after the vaccine's available, I hope that we will have clear metrics of when children don't mask in schools and are, can go and do everything they're supposed to be doing as children. There is known to be a very slight risk to children when it comes to potential damage to their heart um, from the initial studies. How do you weigh that risk? Yes, so that is a true risk. Um, it hasn't been seen in the five to 11, it's myocarditis, which is inflammation mm -hmm. of the heart. Where did we see it? We saw it among 12 to 17 year olds at the vaccine meeting on the 26th that we just had, that they presented the data in that age group that young males after the second dose were more likely to get this rare and, and treatable side effect, but they were likely to get it. And because of that, I have looked at three pieces of data to conclude we should space the time between our doses for young people to eight weeks, which is what I did for my 13 year old. One, immunologic research, it actually makes your T cells and antibodies better. Second, Canada showed us that giving three weeks between doses is not as effective as six to eight weeks. This is data from Quebec two weeks ago. And third, 
is that there was more episodes of myocarditis in Israel, about four times that rate, um, when they gave three weeks spacing between doses than in Canada when they gave eight weeks spacing between doses. So I'm pretty convinced, I already talked to my pediatrician's office, that to really increase that safety and effectiveness, we should space out doses for children eight weeks. And that's okay. what I'm going to do for my 11-year-old. That's what I did for my 13-year-old. All right, appreciate that advice. You know, this week we saw that Contra Costa County, uh, all of the in and out restaurants shut down. There are five of them. And this is a protest over the vaccine mandates to check those vaccinations at the door. What do you think about that action? Do you think that restaurants should still be checking for vaccinations before they let patrons in? So, you know, I supported this on August 20th. I publicly supported that we have vaccine passports and vaccine mandates in the city of San Francisco, for example, which is when it came out there, because at that point we were getting through the Delta surge and vaccinations are important. It is extremely important also to decide when to lift restrictions, including vaccine mandates and passports and masks and contact tracing and everything else based on your levels of immunity and what you're seeing with case rates in the community. So good example, Denmark had vaccine passports mandates. They stopped it all on September 10th. Again, saw increased cases, no budging at least six weeks later and hospitalizations and death. So at a certain point, all restrictions will have to be lifted and we think about the impact on businesses. I don't know if we're there yet. I will say um, I really supported it, but it, uh, there was an article yesterday in the San Francisco Chronicle that thought this was the time to do it, given our low rates. Mm. You know, you've been branded as a doctor who's an outlier because you haven't always agreed with San Francisco's conservative approach to the virus. And in fact, the San Francisco Chronicle uh, recently wrote that you're one of San Francisco's most controversial infectious disease experts. Does that labeling feel accurate to you? It doesn't. Um, I, I have to say that I'm a longstanding HIV doctor. I came to the city in 1996 um, because I was fascinated by infectious disease, but specifically HIV. So I wanted to come to the epicenter of the epidemic to do my training. And um, I have a long history with HIV and what harm reduction means. Harm reduction means you want to reduce cases, just like um, everyone else wanted to reduce cases in San Francisco, but you do it with the context of people in mind. Workers need fit and filtered masks to go inside. Um, people who are poor are still working, so we don't just say stay at home because they have to work. And vulnerable patients can't not come to the clinic because they don't have phones. And uh, fourth, people are lonely. So think, figure out how to see each other safely. So I don't think I'm an outlier. I think only in San Francisco with someone who's worked with the homeless, kept her clinic open because I'm a medical director of a clinic and um, and thought about school openings for public schools, but not private schools uh, because they were open the whole time would be called an outlier. I'm not, I'm not even sure where that comes from. I think from. that's a local phenomenon. <laughs> it's a, it's a very right. San Francisco thing. I think I'm very, very careful actually and all about safety, but also about harm reduction um, in my advice for the pandemic. Well, you've been very active on social media and a lot of the medical community has shared information with the public throughout the pandemic, for example, on Twitter. But you have received some fiercely negative comments and even death threats. And you've said you'll stop posting to Twitter on January 1st, 2022. Is it just that the trolls became too much to handle? Or did you pick that date because you believe the need for your information will have diminished, that the pandemic will essentially be over by then? I don't think it'll be over, but I think the emergency phase of the pandemic will be over because what is we're not accounting for when we think about vaccination rates is what Delta did, and I'm not wanting this to have happened, but there was a lot of transmission. There was 10 million cases in, in, the, um, in the US. Natural immunity is a true phenomenon. It does um, you know, cause protection. And uh, that's probably more than 30 million because we underestimate the number of infections and we're getting a lot more immunity in the population. I think we'll be in a better place then. I think the emergency can only end though when you have deaths around 100 a day. We're at more than 1,000 a day because that emulates what we accept mm -hmm. with flu. But yeah, I, I was attacked by the right because um, I believe in vaccines and masks, and I wrote a lot about masks prior to the pandemic. Double masking really got me a, uh, the death threat. Um, and, then, and then after, I'm actually really interested in mitigation and public health trust. 
Um, and so when do you release these uh, masks? When do you release measures um, and use public health that which will increase public health trust if we look at the true data and decide when restrictions come off? And that right. then earned me um, you know, ire from the other side. So yeah. I think I'll just concentrate on my work, but I will absolutely share um, you know, information in other ways. All right, well, Dr. Monica Gandhi with UCSF, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your insight. Thank you. San Francisco could become the first city in the nation to require sick leave for domestic workers, such as nannies and house cleaners. The proposed legislation introduced this week would create a system for workers to collect sick leave from multiple part-time employers. And California's Employment Development Department was in the hot seat this week as Sacramento lawmakers grilled them over how poorly they handled the flood of unemployment claims triggered by the pandemic. Joining us now to chew on the week's news, our Los Angeles Times political writer, Seema Mehta. She joins us by Skype from Los Angeles. Hi, Seema. Hi, thanks for having me on. And here in studio, we have KQED politics and government reporter, Guy Marzarati. Hi, Guy. Thanks for having me. So Guy, let's start with you. Tell us more about this proposal for healthcare workers to, for, excuse me, healthcare for domestic workers. This was introduced by supervisors Hillary Ronan and Myrna Melgar in San Francisco this week. How would it work? Well, the idea behind this is to help these, you know, thousands of domestic workers in San Francisco get benefits like, you know, paid leave. And the idea is in a lot of cases, these workers are working in multiple households. They're not spending enough time in any specific one of them to rack up enough to get those benefits. So the idea is to kind of work through an app to let those benefits accumulate across different employers, how those employers pay in. And basically this idea of, you know, something as simple as getting a day off when you're sick, not having to come to work sick, is something that we've already seen get a lot of support across the Board of Supervisors. All right. Well, turning now to the state's Employment Development Department, EDD, as it's more commonly known. It's been troubled, to put it mildly, since the pandemic began. It had a backlog of 140,000 cases, and it paid out billions of dollars to scammers. And on Monday, there was a hearing in which members of the State Assembly questioned EDD about the problems. I want to listen to a moment from that hearing. Now, this wasted money could have purchased 16,789 California homes at the median price point paid for a California home. And it could have also paid for four years of schooling at a UC university, and, and those, that total of students would amount to 2,065. And it's also $4 billion more than the entire operating budget of the CSU system. This is a staggering amount of money that was paid out in fraudulent payments. Seema, what progress is being made by the EDD to overcome these issues? There's been a lot of criticism that there, there hasn't been very much progress or that the progress has taken quite so long. And while you're right that this problem was certainly exacerbated by the pandemic, this long predates the pandemic. I mean, there's been issues with this department for years and years. My paper's certainly written about it. Many papers have across the state. Um, beyond that, you know, this goes back to the last recession when many of these programs came up. Um, some of the programs, some of the fixes that are being put in place in terms of increasing the number of people who can um, work on these issues, you know, work on the fraud, uh, take phone calls, they're supposed to be coming in the next couple of months, but the broader problem of technology, that could take a couple of years, which is kind of, it's a little bit ironic given that, you know, we live in the state that has Silicon Valley, that has, you know, the most technology in the, you know, in the country. Um, so I think there's a lot of built up frustration that this has taken so long and that there doesn't seem to be any real clear light at the end of the tunnel yet. All right, well, I do want to skip ahead to another hearing, this one in Washington, D.C. Congressmember Ro Khanna, who represents Silicon Valley, actually, is part of an inquiry, chairing the inquiry, in fact, into big oil and gas companies and how they've exacerbated climate change. This is another firing hearing, so let's take a listen. And I don't believe you purposely want to be out there spreading climate disinformation, but you're funding these groups, and they're really having an impact. You know, they're, they're, they're spending millions of dollars in Congress to kill electric vehicles. And they're spending millions of dollars against the, 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 the methane gas. And you could do something here. You could tell them to knock it off for the sake of the planet. You could end it. You could end that lobbying. Would any of you take the opportunity to look, look at API and say, stop it? Any of you? Congressmember Khanna there is referring to API, which is the American Petroleum Institute, a lobbying group. Guy, where do we go from here? Well, I think you heard it uh, from Congressmember Khanna. He talked to KQED this week and said that he didn't feel like those executives, quote, came clean. He asked for that pledge, right, to make sure that they would distance themselves from these groups that are spreading 
misinformation about the link between uh, emissions and climate change. I think where it goes from here is Democrats furthering this through an investigation. They want to subpoena these companies, try to find those links between oil companies and third party groups who might be putting this information forward. I see it as a race against time, right? These are the kind of issues that Democrats can pursue as long as they have control of the House through hearings and investigations. They have to make progress while they still have that political power. All right, very interesting. We'll be watching this as it goes forward because this is not a one-off. We're going to be having more hearings through the year ahead. Um, Seema, let's turn to redistricting now. California is in the process of looking at district boundaries. In many cases, these boundaries are being examined by new independent boards rather than elected officials. So what does it mean for the process? Is it more fair? I think the proponents of independent redistricting certainly argue that it's more fair. Um, and this is the second time that the state has done independent redistricting. The first time was 10 years ago, which was after voters approved it in 2008. So you have this independent panel of 14 um, citizens, you know, some Democrats, some Republicans, some uh, no party preference, who are drawing these lines. They've been taking testimony for months um, and hearing from various interest groups, but they were the census was super delayed in giving them the data that they need you know, to draw these maps. They're drawing maps for not only Congress, but also the state Senate, um, the state assembly, and the state board of equalization. So now they're in a real time crunch with draft maps due in mid-November and final maps due right around Christmas time. So it's um, you know, people are you know sort of scrutinizing their every move. They're starting to put out these visualizations, as they call them, um, of different maps. And you know you have different communities, whether it's minority communities. Um, geographic communities, different communities of interest, who are all arguing about why you know they should be with this other community or they should be apart from this other community. So there's a lot of jockeying going on right now, and I think you know when those first draft maps come out in mid-November, that's when you know we're really going to see you know who are the winners, who are the losers, and you know whether there are the potential lawsuits. I mean, there's a lot that's going to happen in the next couple months. Yeah, it's certainly crunch time. And Guy, you spent some time on this topic of redistricting just yesterday with a group of East Bay mayors. Tell us about their thoughts and concerns. Right, these were five mayors in the Tri Valley, so Danville, Dublin, Pleasanton, Livermore, San Ramon, and they really feel like they are a unique community that should be represented in one district. They currently have that set up, they're in one state senate district, one state assembly district. They feel like that makes it easy for them to communicate to one member of the state legislature, but that could very well change in this process. In fact, we're seeing already draft maps from the redistricting commission that splits up the Tri-Valley, and it actually has really interesting implications for the balance of power in the House of Representatives. Let me give you an example. In the Central Valley, the, the city of Tracy is currently the most liberal part of Representative Josh Harder's district. That's a, a seat that's been hotly contested in previous years. The, the latest map that we saw from the commission pulls Tracy basically into the Bay Area with cities like hmm. Livermore. So if you take out that you know, liberal piece of Josh Harder's district, it makes it a lot harder for Democrats to win that seat in 2022. All right, and Seema, let's turn to universal basic income pilot programs. They've been popping up around the state over the past couple of years, and Los Angeles is now kicking off the biggest such program yet. Tell us about it. The city started accepting applications today for its universal basic income program. And as you mentioned, you know, many other communities across the country have, have sort of been dipping their toes in this. Stockton was one of the first um, several years ago. And so in LA, they're looking for about 3,200 families that they're going to give $1,000 a month to. Um, today is the first day for applications. The application window will continue for 10 days, and then decisions about the families will be made in January. Um, one of the things that's sort of unique about this program is there are no restrictions on how the money can be used. There's certainly restrictions on who qualifies in terms of you have to be at or below the federal poverty level, you have to either have a child or be pregnant with a child, you have to live in the city. Um, you know, so there are restrictions on who qualifies, but if you do receive the money, unlike some other programs, there's no restrictions on how you can spend it. Um, critics argue that this type of program disincentivizes work, but proponents argue that this really helps people you know who are who are working to help them sort of bring them up to the next level so that they're not dependent you know check to check for you know paying the bills for paying the rent for paying their child care um, so it's going to be the largest, largest experiment of its kind in this country let's take a step back and look at the recall election i know it feels like ancient history we're just talking about six weeks ago uh the final tally closed just last week on the numbers for governor newsom's recall election the data shows newsom increased his margins in counties where majorities had voted for him in 2018 and there had been chatter of reforming the recall process but now it's actively being discussed in the legislature guy what can you tell us about what happened in sacramento yesterday 
Yeah, the process started to look at changing uh, the recall laws in California. The Democratic legislators leading this effort said they're going into it with an open mind. They, they want to end up with a, a, a scenario in which they get bipartisan support for whatever they have to bring to voters potentially to change this. But I have to say, Priya, I was kind of surprised at some of the testimony that we heard in the legislature on Thursday from experts who have been studying this recall process. They said that you know any changes that are made to make it harder to get recalls on the ballot would come with some real drawbacks. I mean, they make the argument that, look, if you're going to raise the signature threshold, which has been one of the most popular ideas for uh, reforming recall in California, we have a pretty low threshold compared to other states, 12% of voters in the last gubernatorial election. They say, OK, if you raise that, there are some consequences. Potentially leaving it to only you know, well-funded interests, big businesses would be the only ones able to perhaps put on a statewide signature gathering campaign and get a recall for it. So there, those are the kind of considerations that lawmakers are going to have to deal with. And I expect this to be a big issue in the legislature next year. Seema Mehta with the LA Times, Guy Marzarati with KQED. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much. And this week's look at something beautiful is a bit of a tongue twister. We check out the festive fall activities at the Pranzini Pumpkin Patch in Petaluma. And that wraps up our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. If you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook. Or email us at knr at kqed.org. You can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. We'll see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great Halloween. Thank you.